of touch on the 60 series and older because those are actually done through the to the green star display instead of through the through the combine armrest uh, control itself. So I guess uh, where I'd like to start here is we're going to run the call center again this year. So for those of you that don't have the phone numbers in your phone, I'll pause here or whatever for a second so you can get them in. We're going to run it during business hours again, just like before. Um, we'll be able to get you an answer to your question on the spot if we can. If not, we'll know who to get in contact with you. So if you don't make another phone call, we'll call you and get you the answer to what you need to keep you up and running. Um, you know, it's uh, people will be in and be very cold here in the front row. Some of you guys may or may not. Why don't you stand up cold? Just in case we have a name of the face. Uh, Monica is here. Um, she can't talk today. She's just had her vocal cords cut out. Um, she'll be healthy by the time uh, call center season runs around. I have no idea where Sam is. He's out there. So, anyway, uh, just see so us some names and faces. There's some people in there again. Like, there's Sam. Sam, just tip your hat. So these guys are raising <laughs> Iowa State grads. They, they work in the Yield Force program, so uh, they don't grind me, they don't precision agriculture. Has everybody got a chance to get those numbers in if you didn't have them? Okay. So the next thing we want to talk about, there will be a meeting without updates, but there's a new update out there on stellar support. And the update this year touches Starfire 3000, GS3, brake controllers, and AT200. And just like always, you'll download the software for the peripheral components to the display. So if you've got the GS2, which you've got a Starfire 3000 on it, you'll download the software for the GS2. Um, if you've got a, a, a GS2, Starfire ITC and ATU 200 for software for the ATU 200. So you have to download software for the 2600 to get it to the ATU 200. If all you've got is GS2, Starfire ITC, ATU 100, something like that, there's no software out there that's going to change anything. There's a couple of combines that we got running in Texas right now. Um, they're running that software, it's been pretty much glitch free. Um, but what the software's got that's out there that you're going to be interested in is, is, is the big thing is, is that GS3 um, display is going to, they're going to, on the last year, under certain conditions, you can get the, the, the uh, coverage map to show up ahead of the, ahead of the header, which made our acres wrong. That's, that's been corrected. And there's also a new feature out there. It's a wireless data transfer, which we're going to talk about here shortly. It's going to be enabled on the screens. So even though, even if you haven't bought wireless data transfer, you're still going to see that functionality, which makes you aware that it's out there. But it's a it's limited, uh, limited production build right now. Uh, I see eight people in this room that have it. Um, don't know what deer is going to give me, but I've got more. Basically, I told deer I'd take all of it. Yeah. So if you're interested afterwards, see us. And we'll be talking about that. The other one that's going to be probably uh, a real benefit to us is the update to the Starfire 3000. You guys have all had where you get near trees or something, and you can't get the line to come back for the accuracy. A lot more critical in planning than it is in harvest, but you know, sometimes it takes 20 minutes for the to get full act, full signal back. Um, what they're stating now is that we will have full signal in under three minutes, 95% of the time. So they're covering your butt. There's always that 5% chance for having problems. I see Mark laughing at me. But you had that a lot last year, so you guys need the update. Um, the Starfire, or not the Starfire, the ATU 200 um, is supposed to is supposed to track on the line, won't hang off to the line. It'll it'll, it'll, it'll uh, acquire the line off the press. I think I missed an update for that. Okay. 
So if you go in the, uh, to get the updates and be in stellar support, just like always, and it'd be the downloads, and you pull it in. If you go in and check uh, your equipment now, some of it's been in the shop, they updated it when it was in here. Um, so if you have a combine you set up, updates probably are in it. But this is what you're looking for, what you're checking for. GS3 is 3.19. Don't worry about the last numbers. The 3000 is 1.8R. ATU is 220B. So those, you know, if, if you got questions, these are posted on uh, Stellar Support or give us a call. Now, one thing that's different when you're updating the GS3s, we're starting to get some of these displays that have got quite a bit of, of data in them now. And what they're recommending with this software update is that you take your uh, take your memory stick, your USB stick, you put it in one, either one of the USB ports on the side of the, the GS3 and export all the data to uh, to a file to a profile that makes sense to you before you do this update. Because otherwise, it goes back in and tries to back the data up when it reloads and there's a chance to get a current file. <coughs> and don't go cheap on it. Just get a new stick someplace. These things do wear out eventually. Do have a finite life. Get a new stick, put the profile on it, spend the eight bucks or six bucks or two bucks or whatever they are, um, and put it in a drawer someplace. So you've got, you've, got, you've got a backup on it. But after you do that, then put the software into the display. And as you'll see on that second bullet point there, don't read the whole thing, but as you'll see on that second bullet point there, it's not what you're going to see is you're going to see the display look like it's in a constant reboot. When you put that in there, it's going to do it three times. Third one is when it's actually going to come up, you're going to see your John Deere and you're going to see your own things again. So don't get alarmed if it looks like it's rebooting a bunch because it is. And then there's a, yeah. Check how, check. how do we delete everything that's in there? So when you go to the memory tab, there's going to be an option that says to erase to clear the memory. And they're going to give you the option of taking just the raw data out. Fill me in, you do a lot more than I do, Brett. Uh, it's going to give you an option of, of just removing removing the files that you've created, uh, planning or harvest files, whatever, or basically your documentation, or you can remove all files, which is going to remove your machines, uh, farms and fields, all Does that Does it say stuff. remove all? Yeah, there, it'll, it'll give you the option. If you remove all of them, you're going to have to reload the profile back through Apex SMS or whatever. <clears throat> but you're going to anyway, you're going to put your variety of locator files uh, on this fall for instance. So you're going to be replacing the RC full folder. Is that clear or the mud or yes? And then Apex, there's a new version of Apex that came out less than a month ago. We've been utilizing it. It, it, it works. There's no no errors that we can find. We haven't broken it. Um, but we're going to need that so the files match up so we don't have any potential for corrupt files. Um, so we talked about this last spring. We touched this once. This is a login place for my John Deere. This is where the new technology comes in. And John Deere is pushing this hard. And I'm going to kind of tie all this together because it's kind of going to make sense where I'm going with this. But what John Deere is pushing for is one login, one password for every account. So instead of having a separate JD Link account, a separate John Deere financial account, you know, only God knows what else we've got with John Deere now. We've got to remember usernames and passwords. They're consolidating everything into one. So what you've actually got here, this is my home page when I come up. You guys won't see anything with the dealer, you won't see service advisor, you won't see agriculture pathways. The things that you are going to see that are going to be, you'll see your job, your financial accounts, you'll see JD Link, you're going to see what they call my operations. We're going to talk about that one. You're going to see Stellar Support, which is where you should type in stellarsupport.here.com to get your software downloads. You can log in once, simply click on this, and it'll bring this stuff up. Now, the direction John Deere is going with this, yes, Neil? Do we log in with our Stellar Support? Yes. The, the that is your use use for Stellar Support? Yes. Okay. Now, what's going to happen with this when you log in is it's going to try and consolidate some of your accounts. And 
we're going to have to end up from the dealership making the request to get them all into one. So if you've got six logins to Stellar, which you do, um, we got to get those consolidated into one. So be in contact with us help. You're going to get some more to talk about here. We're going to get some more correspondence from these guys. Um, if you've got Jane Lane, they will list them. S-Series combines, 8R tractors, 7R tractors with Jane Lane. So that'll be coming up. But this, um, what we're going to do here is you're going to get an email. Those of you that have got, got into those, the equipment that I mentioned ahead of time, you're going to get an email that comes from John Deere. you got one, Dennis. Has it got my name on it or it's got my name on it? So what you guys are going to see, and we're going to start with the Yield Force customers first because it's imperative that they have this. But what you're going to see is you're going to see an inbox. It's from John Deere. It's got my name on it. It says Sigourney Tractor is requesting to have permission to do things with your account. Now, John Deere is, I don't know what I want, anal about security. And so when, when, when that email comes, they're going to ask you to log on to my John Deere. They're going to ask you to change your password. The other thing they're going to ask you, they're giving you an option to use default security, or you can go in and customize what we can see as a dealership. So you can have it so we can see nothing. You can have it so that we can see the JD Link side of your tractor, so that we can utilize Service Advisor Remote, for instance, so the techs can pull up the codes on your, on your tractor. They can clear the codes from see what's going on, they can take readings, they can even push software in your tractor, you can take it to that level, or you can take it to a point where we can see your agronomic data that you collect for when we're doing yield maps or writing prescriptions or data analysis or whatever, or anything in between. So they give you that option, but the one point that I would, the minimum that I would give us is the equipment option to see the equipment. Because if you don't do that, we don't get we don't need to do anything with service advisor remote. And when, we, when you try to track your back in, you have to log in to JD Link, and you've actually got to take that tractor out of your account, reassign it to us. So a lot of stuff that I can do on the back side um, if, if, if you give if you choose to give us that. So um, I guess see us with questions if you have individual questions. It pretty much spells out exactly what you can can can't do with that. And I described that pretty close, Dennis. Okay. So then, so you're going to see some more features on this um, with my operations. And pretty much what we're going to talk about next is going to involve that. Um, but what I'd like to do next is I'd like to, so it makes sense, I'm going to toss out some things about crop insurance this year. It'll kind of make the rest of the conversation I want to have make more sense. I've got some handouts here. You can get these handed out, Sam. Um, because it kind of looks like we're going to need crop insurance this year. And a lot of the technology that we're talking about, those of you that are running late model equipment, you bring purchase for them. The ability to do automated crop reporting, for instance. Now, these machines are gathering a lot of data. And you might as well utilize the data that it's, that it's got. So it makes life easier for you. And so what, we, what we're handing out here is I've got a sheet that's got a, a yield monitor calibration checklist on the front side. And then on the back side of it, what I've got on here, you guys have seen these when you use those uh, barcode scanners on your phones or your iPads. They have videos, they're how-to videos. Um, Talk about automated crop reporting, talks about planning, after planning, calibrating the monitors, you know, how to harvest. It's got some free information on there that you can just scan the videos and come up. And then the second piece that I've got, it's got a front and back on it. It's got some uh, uh, common questions and answers, you know, can we accept real monitors for, for production reporting? What do, you, what do you need? And I'm not going to go through those. You guys can all read them. Um, but the long and short of it is, you know, if, if you've got that technology, you should probably look at it and utilize it for the crowd insurance. And two odds and ends, I was talking with an insurance agent here yesterday, and nothing here is really um, earth shattering, but there's some 
points that, that she mentioned that I might want to bring up in the meeting. So just as a reminder, if you've got last year's grain and then you need to have a company adjuster come out and measure what's there before you pour more on top of it. You know, kind of makes sense. Um, and if you got some corn that you're going to chop the silage, you've got the insurance agent know ahead of time with that. And this one really makes sense this year since it's probably going to be dry. Your crop insurance policy does not cover damage to fields to account by fire. So um, that's not a crop insurance, that's going to pay a fire. Yeah, you, can, you need to add a cave cost, and you can do that at any time. But just don't let your um, field burn up thinking that it'll be covered and walk back to the house and call. Big guys in the back hear that? <laughs> okay, okay. And then this one I think is significant. I think if you wouldn't mind, Andy, I'd like you to elaborate on this one. All right. But the USDA requires audits or reviews of policies that exceed 200000 per crop per county. And this requires a three year APH review. So have your agent check your total dollar liability for each crop and the process can start now. Or can you elaborate on that, Andy? Um, yeah, probably on my, just, just, just real quick, um, the, you have to have a review on 200000 or above, which if you have very many um, acres in a section or whatever, you're going to get to 200000 really quick, with, and especially if the price goes down. So um, have your agent look at your total liability. They'll be, and it goes per crop per county. So if you've got 500 acres in Keokuk County and 500 in Iowa County or whatever, have them look to see what your total liability is. And if, you're, if your total liability is 600,000 in that area, you're gonna be to 200,000 really quick. So you have to do probably a three, unless the government releases these um, audits that they're going to do, you'll have to have one done. And that kind of, you can start gathering those records now so it won't show, um, throw your regular loss in the fall, delay it. So, you know, so you can start gathering, you'll need settlement sheets or sales sheets, um, tickets, whatever you've got, feed records to start gathering all that if you need it. You know, depending a lot on what the price does. But on that kind of stuff, um, that'll be probably be a big issue if you've got very many. And it goes per crop per county. So um, <clears throat> does that make it any clearer? Or that actually made clearer for me. It did it? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So just contact your agent and have them look at what you've got. And you know, if you fit, if you're expecting 80 yield for corn. Um, you know, and your liability is 600000 and you're expecting half of that, then you're going to be there real quick. So that's probably the biggest thing. We'll be around afterwards, Angie. Yeah, I'll oh, be around. Okay. Chase Angie down. She gets explained it a whole bunch better than that. And then last year when Mike Johnson was here, <coughs> scale tickets in and put your calibrations on the back because they want it to be within 3% to uh, make it valid calibration so you can use automated crop reporting. So let's get a record. Go accept that. Uh, I don't have any of these you get for your crop insurance is, agent. Is there a minimum amount of calibration you have that for the They, you, What they actually do on that question and answer sheet, Neil, is, is what it says. It says as long as it's been calibrated, um, to manufacturer specs. And the big thing to remember with the calibrations is when you go from, when you have a wild swing crop, 30% corn, 18% corn, 56% test weight, whatever, or not percent, pound test weight. You know, when you get a wild swing in there, it's best to do another calibration. That'll keep it, keep it. As long as stuff is similar, that's why I recommend it to delete last year's calibrations out of the S series combines. Um, on yours with the with the odd series, it's a linear calibration, so you can use that as a starting spot. You can make sure from there and then you adjust from there. So <clears throat> anyway, so so from from my John here, I know I got off here a little bit, but this makes sense to move on. I'm going to talk about JD Lane first. Now we're getting more and more of these machines 
and how you're triggered. And a lot of you guys are learning these things now. Um, and, and this is this is sample data that's on here that we got done here. I'm not showing anybody's machine, so don't worry about that. Um, but what this is, this is JD Lane. With, with, with this on here, what this will do for you is so I talked about service advisor a moment. The techs could actually, from wherever they were, they could diagnose your machine have the right parts when they showed up, or potentially cure the issue without even making a trip to the machine. You know, so that's that's probably worth some stuff right there. What I did on this one, when I pulled this up, I pulled up uh, this year. So this is every place the tractor was that it called in this spring. Um, and this in itself, in Southeast Iowa, probably doesn't have a lot of validity for you guys as owner operators. But for a service department, if somebody calls Tony or Tom or Tish, and rather than try to explain to them how to get to where you're going, they can find your machine, they can get directions um, to your machine from where they're at. They've got to call your machine, they ping the machine, and then it'll bring up on the way. Well, that happens too when they have the out. But that's, that's for the supervisors, meeting, not this one. So they can actually call your machine and get directions to it from there. Um, but here's what another piece of the puzzle that's really interesting with this. You've probably seen some of this before, but you can get reports on, on what the machine was doing. I know I talked about this last spring, but I can't stress it enough because the machine that we actually have here um, is, is, is a classic example of something that we're doing. This machine pulls a planner. That's all it does. And we've got the you know, we know how many hours it's done it. We know how much engine load it's taken. So when this machine sits in the end of the field, the CCS fan running, the hydraulic pumps running, idling, using 20% of the available horsepower to still overcome that. When this, when this gentleman is, is planning, he's using 51% of the available horsepower. He's going down the road, he's using 61.9%. But this is a this is probably a pretty powerful tool that you guys can have. If you see something like this, you know, maybe you get with your salesman and maybe you don't need to buy as big a tractor. Don't, I didn't say that for you. But, I mean, you're really not much. You can use to help size your machines to, you know, what you're actually using for horsepower. It's every size bigger seems to be another $30,000. Know, just a point. But the other thing that works with, too, is hired help. You know, if you got, if you got a lot of hired help, you can see how that machine's actually being used. And then here's the other thing that's useful if you give us the ability to see this when, when, when we sign up to my job here. We can actually see the air codes. These are the air codes that this tractor produced on the on, on, on dates that we have up there. And so when these air codes show up, and if we're sending them to the service department, they can predict what's going on or give you a call and say, hey, you got a sensor that's out on that. That yellow light keeps flashing on there that's annoying you. You know, we can we can fix that. We know what it is. We have the parking stop. We can stop out. That's, that's another option on here. And you, but you'd also get a copy of this, so it would show up in your box. So you'd be able to print this all off or read it to the you know the <coughs> service manager, your favorite tech, and tell them what's going on. So it is. That's another piece of data that's collected that is useful. But now we're going to get into another thing that is doing here. And this is these are files that are coming off of wireless data transfer. This is where it's going to kind of tie back into the crop insurance. And, and also yield force and about anything else you want to do with it. These are files that are created. And, and on this one, it's set up that every time they change client to farm or field, it automatically sends the file. So instead of having to stop and load it on a flash drive or a memory stick, it sends it. It's on the cloud. You can retrieve it. You can send it wherever you want to go. You can send it. You can send it. You can retrieve it, you can send it to the cloud, you can retrieve it from the cloud to your Apex every night without having to wait for everything to download. You can send it to Brett crew, you know, to get to get data analysis and spread files. Um, you know, you can clean the data and then send it back out so that your crop insurance agent can have it so that the process started if we're gonna show if we're gonna show a loss. Um, and it, it just makes it easier and, and faster. Jeff, are those files combined if you start a field, go to another field, and then come back to that field? 
Actually, they are. And so what's going to be, it's going to look, what you're going to have, if you start the field here and move to the next one and come back to this field, it's going to show us three separate files. But when it comes in, it's going to combine them just like it does in Apex. So right now, when you look at the raw data that comes in on Apex, you might see a stack of files this long and they will be saying that it'll put them together inside of the software. Is that what you were asking for? Yep. Okay, so you won't see, the only way you'll see a partial field is if you open just partial field. Um, but what, this is files that's gone in and out. This is the same with that at the end, but this files that have gone in and out with their notes with uh, some test for John Deere so that we can see these. You can just select the ones you're interested in so you don't spend a lot of time down there. So this is where another one that if you look at this right here, maybe it doesn't look that interesting for a lot of us when we're the owner operator. But more and more of us are having dad run a combine and a hybrid man someplace. And what this is, I just picked one day with, with a pair of combines that were that were combining. Now in itself, both combines started up here and the combine the remainder of these fields. That one stayed put. This one drove to the next field and shut it down for the night. So something like this would be useful if you had to get grain trucks moved, fuel tanks moved, operators to the right spot. You know, that'd be useful for that. But I'm going to break it down a little further. So if I zoom in on this, you can actually see what they count on that particular day. So you can tell, is a field done? Did my hired man go over here count by the neighbors? Got by his own. He spent the afternoon sleeping under the tree. You know, you can you can tell these things, but there's another thing here. We collected data here. We collected we collected the we're combining, collected what the variety was, we collected what the moisture was. We did all this in real time. So what this does that gives us something really interesting is <laughs> this. You guys ever seen something like this before? This looks this is a production report, it's a harvest report. And once again, it's sample data. This one shows 502 bushels per acre. It's just data we plugged in. You know. But my point is, you know, this time of year, seed guys are out to sell you seed as you know, they should be. And you can get a production report that tells you how many acres of this variety I had, what the average yield was, this field, how many pounds I got, what the moisture was. So in real time, my dry pad, you pull my John Deere, you get the same production reports that you would get off of Apex or SMS or wherever. You get it in real time in the cab, you know, based on what you actually get in the time frame that you're actually looking at. You know, the other thing that this is good too is like, hmm, under my threshold here, I guess we, uh, I guess we got to send something somewhere. So my point in showing you those first three slides is there's there's a lot of data that's being collected by this machine, and if I don't get the machines into your into your game. I send an email out. If I don't get them there, we have a lot of data collected that's sitting in, you know, it's in cyberspace and it's doing any good. Now, once again, this is this is that limited production bill that I was talking about. We had a few slots left. Requires us to make it work. It's JD Link enabled and GS3. So I'm missing something. I didn't talk about remote display access. But it's coming. I think that's coming. Oh, it's coming. Okay. I'm hurrying, guys. I know I'm running along. I'm good with that. Uh, I was wanting to touch on machine sync. We've got a few of these units out. And this is where the combine operator actually runs the green card. It's, it's really, really pretty cool. It's not all that complicated. I just wanted to touch on it. We still have time to get some of you guys are interested in it. What's that, Steve? Yeah, but it's automatic. You try to crash it, it doesn't work. So what it's basically doing is keeps an equal distance between the outline and the tractor. That's essentially what it does. You know? So all you gotta have to make it work, you got a Starfire 3000, any signal work, Starfire ITC, you got an RTK, Green Star 3 controllers, you gotta put communication radios in, and of course the activations. The cool thing is you only need an auto track activation on the tractor. You can drive the combine, you can auto track the combine, it doesn't care because it maintains the 
same distance from the uh, uh, maintains the same distance from the, the combine to the track at all times. And what's new for this year is that the Oregon Auto Track it works in any track. We can drive a circle track. We can use adaptive curve. We can use A B curves. It doesn't care. It will work. Um, and then for the tractor side, basically you have to have an S series combine, 70 series combine. And out of the tractors, basically every tractor works except for row crop track tractors and 9030Rs. Right, Brett? Part. Yes. RTs? 9030. Anything? Yeah, 9030. T. T. Thank you. It's the track tractors that are throwing me off here. So, other than that, you know, we, we, we can do that. Um, and then the last thing that I want to talk about before I get out of this is remote display access. When this first came out, it was expensive. It was real expensive. But what it was, I've got a video, I'm going to show you how this works. Um, but what it is, is, is you can see your display. We can see your display. You can, you can pull it up on your iPad. So if, if Dad calls you and says, hey, I can't get this thing to paint, you can actually pull his display up on your iPad and talk you through what's going on with it. Um, you can call our call center and you can pull it up. Once again, it works great <coughs> as long as, you know, we've got the screens memorized and it's high set an AP line, fine. But if you want to see what's actually on the page, we get real diagnostics, we want to know what voltages are or what address has what value in it, we can actually see what's on your screen so you don't have to read it to us. Because in, 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 invariably, You'll call and you'll, you'll finally talk talk the guy on the other end of the phone and get the right address to give you the code. And then they'll transpose the number. And then you're back or over at square one. Or you're looking for voltages. And you know what voltage you're looking for, but you can't explain to which line it's on. So it helps with this. Um, once again, we need a JD Link enabled machine. Back to the JD Link thing. Somebody can do this to death. And all the technology is based on that. But what they've done now, if you buy any, any any tractor you bought here forward that's got JD Link on it, it comes with it. It's included. The ultimate package, the remote display axis is included. All you have to do is go see Mr. Gorge at the parts counter, and he'll give you a $120, 13-foot long blue cable that you plug in into work. Um, for those of you that have a, a JD Link <coughs> subscription already, it's $100 a year. That's all it is. So, you know, it, you know, you can get back going quick or it really make a big difference that way. Plus, it's the same exact cabling and, and components that you use for wireless management. Um, just to show you how it works, I got a two minute video for Dan, who's just shows how, how it basically could work. So it does work. I'll just click on this and I'll quit talking and let Brett talk after this. Where's that going? Troy. It's going. <laughs> Hey, and this is Kyle. Hey, how are you doing today? Not bad. How about yourself? Okay. Yeah, well, I just pulled into the field here, and I'm um, having trouble with my 2630. Uh, I think I got a prescription for this field, but I can't seem to figure out how to load it. I wonder if you can help me out. Okay. Yeah. How far away are you today? I'm probably a couple hours away from the dealership. Okay. We can kind of see where you're at now. Um, I can go ahead and remotely access your display in the cab. Ah, okay. Then I can see your screen and kind of help you through your issue. That'd be great. So I'm going to go ahead and send a request to your display now, and you'll be getting a message in the cap that'll have my name and then the name of the dealership as well. And that's just the remote display access session request. So once you accept that, I'll be able to see your display back at the dealership. Okay, sure. It'll take a couple minutes though to actually send a message to get there. You should be seen in any minute here. Well, there's the request. Just accept. Okay. Okay, now I'm waiting for that accept message to get back to me here at the dealership. And it looks like it went through successfully. Once you see that blue outline around the display, that means that I can see it back at the dealership. 
Okay, great. So I can see that you're on the mapping screen right now. Is this where you want to see your prescription? Yep. Okay, so we're going to go down to the uh, document tab at soft key I. Do you see that off to the right? Oh, yeah. There it is. And if we go ahead and select that, you'll see that button in the bottom right that says RX on it. That's where you're going to be able to select your prescription. Okay, sure. So if you press that button, there's going to be a drop down where you can select your screen prescription today and accept. And then once we've loaded that prescription, we're able to view it in that map screen. I think I have it loaded now. What do I need to do? And then in order to view that on your map, we'll go back to the mapping screen, soft key A. Okay, so what we're going to do is there's a map settings button at the bottom of this screen. We're going to have you select that and then select the prescription as the background. And you'll be able to view that prescription while you're applying the field. Okay. So that's looking a lot better. Is there anything else that I can help you with today? Uh, I think it should be good at this point. I appreciate the help. All right, Kyle. Have a good day, screen. All right, thanks. I mean, that can be a fairly, fairly powerful tool. And what I've got here on the end, at any point in time, if you want to cancel the session, if you hit the end session, I think you can no longer see that screen. So you've got full control over who and when. So, Mr. Brazil, what do you think? If you want to take over from here, Brad. Uh, just want to take take you guys through some of the setup stuff. We're not going to spend a whole lot of time on, on the generic things. We're just going to uh, revisit some of the, the key things that seem to give us quite a few fits every year. Um, TCM calibration, we touched on this earlier. Um, that's one of the things with the new updates on the 3000 receivers. We no longer can push that button twice and have the TCM calibrated. We've actually got a uh, set the machine up, mark, mark your spot, start the calibration process, spin the machine around and finish it up that way. Uh, no more cheating on, on that, we've had too many issues. Uh, basically, if we don't calibrate it, and we need to calibrate every time we, we move the receiver to a different machine, but basically if we don't calibrate, what can happen is we can, if we're running on a side hill or something and, and we don't have that train compensation calibrated, we can get overlap going one way and uh, show gaps on our coverage uh, going the other way. So it's very important that we do that every time we switch machines. Um, RoSense, I know Travis kind of touched on it with the S-Series. This is going to be for the older model combines. Um, basically, we've got to go into the, the old brown box on the, on the GS2 or GS3 display. Uh, you'll hit your setup, you hit the select auto track, and this is where we're going to come in and say that, that row guidance is installed. Uh, you can also calibrate it here before season uh, by selecting letter D. That's going to bring you to this page. Uh, you'll hit letter E to calibrate the sensors. And what we're looking for up here, right up above that, you'll see the left sensor calibration and right sensor calibration. Um, we really don't care what the numbers for each one of those sensors is. The left one's going to be somewhere below 2.5 and the right one will be above 2.5. But you're always going to have to add up to 5 volts for it to be functioning properly. Um, on the newer on the newer machines here on the S series, uh, we'll basically do this from the GS3. Uh, you go main menu GS3 or Green Star 3. Uh, letter B for guidance, and then you'll go into your row sense settings, and you'll just have to hit the uh, button there on the system status where it says enable or disable. Uh, on the row entry. 
you can either select it for GPS or you can select manual as your two options mm -hmm. uh, for coming back in off the end rows. Uh, on the new on the new combines, this is where you'll go to calibrate your your feelers. Uh, you'll go main menu GS3, the diagnostics, and then you'll uh, scroll down to view your row sense, and then down at the bottom again, you'll press the calibrate, and that's where it'll where it'll do its calibration. Um, on the older combines, this will be uh, 60 series and older, just to refresh your memory. Uh, as far as yield calibration, moisture calibration, things like that, this is where we'll, we'll do all that. We'll have to go into the old brown box. Uh, make sure you've got your, your correct uh, header type selected there as well. Uh, Letter D is cal uh, yield calibration, E is moisture, and then your, your recorded stop height for, for that particular head zone here as well. Um, moisture correction. A lot of guys get confused every year. So if we're running along and, and uh, the display says we're <coughs> picking 17% corn, we run a sample to town and it's 16 and a half. Basically, we need to drop it a half point. We're going to drop it a half point from whatever it's showing on the display right now. So from point eight, we'd adjust it down to point three. Uh, if it was running a half a point dry from what the elevator's saying, we'd actually adjust that to 1.3. Uh, we, we don't start over from zero every time. We, start, we correct from where the current setting is. Uh, as far as yield calibration, there's a couple different ways we can do it. Uh, we can either go in and uh, start the start the calibration. Uh, it'll it'll drop your scale weight to zero. You can go and harvest the load. When you get done harvesting that load, hit the stop button. You can continue to harvest until the truck gets back with the field ticket to town or wherever you're going with it. And then come into uh, letter E there, enter your actual scale weight, and it will uh, change your calibration factor for you. If you want to do it a different way, um, as long as you've got your start weight and your end weight of when you're dumping on that truck so that we can get a net amount, uh, we can go in and do a calculation. Uh, it's just display whatever the weight shows on your display, divided by whatever the scale ticket shows, multiply that by your old calibration number, and then we can go in and plug in the new one and uh, come up with the same result. Diagnostics page. Uh, just want to make sure everybody's familiar with this. Um, if you call in and uh, have an issue, more than likely this is probably the first place we're gonna gonna have you go. Uh, it'll be main menu GS2, GS3, whatever you got, and then that book with the wrench. And then you'll be able to select the drop-down box, and we can view whatever whatever we're having an issue with and, and go through and try and diagnose it that way. This is showing recording, so if, if our coverage map's not filling in behind the combine, uh, we can come in here and we're gonna we're gonna ask you, you know, look down through here, tell us what says no. Uh, maybe it's something as simple as we've got two tabs up the top of our uh, document page something like that. Uh, this will be the quickest way for us to figure out what, what the issue is. Uh, variety locator. A lot of you guys are running uh, the planting maps in, in Harvest uh, for variety locator so that it will automatically uh, change varieties as we're going through the field. A couple things we need to make sure of 
Um, we can't just, to start out the season, we can't just put a check mark in that box for variety locator, even though we have a, it says we have a file. Uh, we've got to go in and make sure that we load a crop, uh, a brand and a variety, and then we can put the check mark back in and it will start uh, doing the automatic variety switching. Here's a, here's a new app for smartphones that John Deere just came out with, so I guess maybe everybody but Jeff Albert ought to <laughs> check that out here. Um, if you log on, or if you go to the app store on your smartphone and type in John Deere Harvest, um, it's going to give you two, it's going to give you two options. It's going to give you a, a U.S. version and then it's going to give you an overseas version. So make sure you select the, the proper one, uh, otherwise you won't be able to read it. What this is geared for, it's, it's geared for the uh, the new S series combines, but it will, you know, it, it will it will work on on the older uh, series rotor combines. Basically, what you, what it enables you to do is to help you fine tune uh, your settings on the combine. And we went in here and just, uh, if I remember right, I, we selected the sieves on on this one. But uh, it's going to start out and just asking you a question. Are, are your losses too high? And I selected yes. Is green tank, tank sample satisfactory? No. Increase your cleaning fan speed is what it told me to do. So I said yes, I increased cleaning fan speed. Are losses reduced? And then you can either select yes or no. And it's, you know, if you select no, it's going to take you to the next step of what, what you need to do. But it's just kind of a... Uh, a quick way for you to look that up and, and maybe do, some, do a little fine tuning. I'll put that back up here so you guys can make sure everybody gets that wrote down, that, that John Deere harvest. I mean, you won't be able to select your exact model, but it's going to be very similar to what it, it's, it's for, geared for the S series as far as the models you can select. I'll keep you posted, Stan, when they come out with new ones. Um, they were talking about expanding this one. This is the one I got in the market one version. There's all S series, so I had a look at it. It's, it's, I'll keep you posted. 